Welcome back to the SaaS Revolution Show. I'm your host, Alex Duma, CEO, founder of SaaStock. Today, I'm delighted to be joined uh, by uh, Meron Kolbechi. Um, I, I was uh, <laughs> worried about saying that, but uh, Meron, welcome to the SaaS Revolution Show. Uh, where, are you calling in from, uh, where are you calling in from today? Thank you for having me. Uh, I'm calling you from Tel Aviv right now. You from Tel Aviv, from Israel? Yes. So originally uh, born and raised in Israel, uh, spent a very long time in, in Europe, in Berlin for a few years, and then for 10 years in the, in the Bay Area. Uh, recently came back uh, home uh, after a, a, a long round the world uh, about six months ago. So I'm now based here in our uh, little office for uh, checkout. Very cool. Yeah. So yes, and you're now chief product officer for checkout.com. I think you've been there just a little bit under two years. Is, is that right? Yeah, a year and a half. Mm -hmm. A year and a half. And I think, uh, and we'll probably get to that, but was, uh, was checkout.com like number one in the Forbes Cloud 100 like last year or, or sort of recently? It's like pretty much up there, right? Yeah, I mean, the, these accolades, we, 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 we get them uh, once in a while. Checkout is essentially a, a solution provider for uh, financial services, for payments, uh, for uh, enterprises. So yep. we provide uh, payment acquiring and other services around uh, the, the payment services to enterprises and more recently to integrated platforms, marketplaces, and other types of um, uh, people who need uh, payment services. So yeah, we can get into the product suite over time. We, we would. So uh, but for, for, I guess, first of all, before we get into all, all, all of that, and uh, you, you did mention, obviously, we, we, we know that your CPO of Checkout.com, we know that you've traveled around a, a little bit and, you know, come back home. But who, who are you, uh, you know, as a person? Who is uh, uh, Meron Kobechi as a person? Well, uh, sometimes I ask myself the same question. So I have uh, uh, a family, wife and three kids, and more recently a dog uh, that has joined our family. I obviously have been in product management as a professional for the last uh, 15 to 20 years, uh, something that I'm very passionate and, and, and care a lot about. You know, I'm, I'm into obviously the uh, reading. Um, I, uh, I like uh, photography. In the last few years, um, and especially since COVID, I've started running uh, more and more. Uh, I have recently finished uh, my second marathon. And uh, towards the end of the year, I hope to run uh, New York as well. Very cool. Uh, any, have you, you ever th thought about like, I want to go into ultra marathons or uh, anything like that? Was that just too crazy? Um, so marathon people are crazy. Yeah. Ultra marathon uh, are like super crazy. I've had <laughs> um, a few friends that have done some insane races in the desert over multiple days. And this is the type of stamina and, and, and uh, capabilities that I simply don't have, uh, nor the time, quite frankly, to, uh, to train for. I don't blame you, but um, okay. So, and, and like we said, like you, you just been under two years as, as the chief product officer of Checkout.com. Is it Checkout or Checkout.com? What do you say? The official name is Checkout.com. Internally, we refer to it as Checkout. Yes. Okay. Uh, very cool. But t tell us a little bit about uh, if you can share just like the 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 founding story of Checkout, and and then why don't you share like why you actually joined the, the company? Yeah. So Guillaume Pizza, who's our our founder and, and CEO. It started a business about a little over 10 years ago, initially uh, creating a, a gateway uh, for uh, to accept payments um, with a, a small team in, in Mauritius, uh, actually. Over time, uh, the team um, sort of uh, rebased itself into the UK, got a, a, a license uh, over there and started really rolling out to a lot of UK companies and European countries. Um, expanded into into the Middle East, uh, into APAC, and more recently we've expanded into uh, the U.S. as well. So really a story of, of one of global expansion. Two, uh, I think, is our evolution as a product uh, company. Our original product is really uh, card acquiring. That's the that's the core uh, capability that we have. So when you want to pay online at a at an e-commerce uh, website. A lot of times, checkout uh, checkout.com is the underlying infrastructure that facilitates uh, accepting those uh, those payments. 
But um, as we've evolved and worked with our customers, we've, we've, we've discovered that there are a lot of other capabilities that, that the companies do. So you're accepting payments. Now, um, sometimes you have needs in order to pay out your vendors or to pay out your employees. Um, so we've developed uh, payouts as another capability. We've expanded our product suite from just accepting cards to accepting other forms of alternative payment methods like PayPal and Klarna. Expanded into value added, additional value added services. So we provide fraud uh, detection capabilities uh, and authentication capabilities on top of uh, acquiring. And more recently, we've launched uh, issuing as, a, as another sort of form to complement our, our product suite. So as an e commerce website or as a fintech, you want to uh, not only accept payments, but also to issue cards to your user in order to give them faster access to funds. So we're enabling you to issue like tailored cards, either physical or digital, uh, that allow you to do uh, a lot of different things from paying your vendors to uh, being able to connect uh, a card to your wallet um, and so on and so forth. So really a story of expanding our capabilities, expanding the networks that we support and expanding the different products that we're able to uh, serve to our customers. Primarily, we focus on uh, fintech and e-commerce as our two sort of primary verticals. Historically, we've also served the, the crypto industry, although that industry is under, currently undergoing a bit of, a, a bit of turmoil, um, so less of a focus at this point, but um, definitely uh, expanding into uh, new verticals as well. Tell us a little bit about like, why, why you joined the company and, you, you know, where you sitting in Tel Aviv one day and Guillaume is it you know picks up the phone or, or you know message you on LinkedIn and you know convince you to join like what will tell us a little bit about that and why you joined yeah so before before checkout I was uh, I was working at Facebook so um, at the time it was called Facebook now it's Meta um, I was working on for a few years I worked on the the Libra project um, I don't know if, if, if you're familiar but essentially Facebook was thinking about a, uh, developing a cryptocurrency uh, that would be a new currency in the world that would uh, enable sort of movement of money freely on Facebook and off Facebook. We created a conglomerate or an association of uh, a number of large companies that contributed to the, um, both to the technology as well as to the, to the partnership. Uh, that project failed after many, many years. And I was working on additional things uh, within Facebook. But we were also customers of Checkout. So they were doing uh, payment processing uh, for us uh, for, for that initial pilot that we were, that we were rolling out. So I got to know Checkout as a product. I got to know uh, a little bit about the team and, and how they worked and how they operated and their service orientation. I was very impressed with that. And so one day, a mutual colleague of Guillaume and mine, uh, or a mutual acquaintance of both of us, uh, reached out and connected us and said, hey, the two of you should meet. Um, there may be an opportunity here. And then I started talking to Guillaume. After a few times, uh, a few Zoom conversations, flew over to London and met him in person for uh, a full day of interview, which, by the way, is a very, very good way to get to know uh, uh, someone that you'll be getting to work with. Uh, we both got to know each other, and from there we decided that it was a good idea for me to join. Very cool. Yeah, I've I've heard. Uh, I don't know, like at smaller like SaaS companies, where, whether they do this, but certainly some of the bigger companies. And I know an example of somebody that interviewed at uh, Okta for like a GM role, where you know they flew over and then spent the whole day, you know, with like the founders and uh, in in doing however many interviews during the day. But then you spend it's pretty much twenty four hours and then making a very kind yeah. of decision. So is this quite like typical practice in? Would you say in bigger companies? Have you seen this in, in smaller? I, I have to say, I don't know that this is a very common practice, okay. although, and, and this is something that I learned from, from, from Guillaume, from Guy, but, but I think is very, very, very productive because, you know, you, 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 you can show up in a certain way for an interview that's 45 minutes or, or even an hour, and then you switch out, et cetera, et cetera. Throughout the day, and if and especially if you spend like good quality time and it's different sessions that go over you know the product strategy or the you know the finances of the company or um, you know a deep dive into the team and then you know you maybe you go to dinner and you like talk about other stuff and you get to know each other on a more personal level you get a very round picture of the individual and it's a very good way to to assess and i think that especially for uh, leadership positions uh, for critical uh, hires in the company i think it's very important that there's also a good 
uh, alignment from a philosophical perspective, alignment of values. There's a good personal connection because at the end of the day, you're going to spend a lot of time with these people, right? Like with these critical people, you're going to be in the room. The environment might be, there, there might be a, a stressful environment. There might be a decision that we need to make and you need to make sure that you can really work with those people and that you can build uh, trust and, and rapport uh, with them. So to answer your question, I don't know if it's common, but I think it's a very good practice. Makes sense. And then I guess kind of final thing about the company, like what data can you share about it? You, you know, so like from when it was founded to, to now, you know, how many people can you share anything, you know, around re revenue? Well, you know, yeah. some of the key metrics. So in terms of, you know, we, we focus primarily on enterprise. We have about uh, 1,500 uh, enterprise customers that we serve uh, across the world. And, you know, essentially uh, in the last year, we processed hundreds of billions of dollars of, uh, of, of TPP total payment volume for, uh, for our customers. In terms of employees, we have uh, somewhere between, depending on the day, between 1,800 and 1,900 uh, employees. That's where we currently are. And I think that, uh, you know, as I mentioned before, primary, like our, our bigger businesses are UK, Europe, have a very good business in, in, in MENA and in APAC, and really starting uh, our first uh, foray into uh, North America. Eventually, you might go to Latam, but currently, that's not uh, somewhere that we uh, that we serve from that perspective. Okay, cool. Thanks for sharing that. And from a from a uh, from a fundraising perspective, uh, Series D uh, was raised uh, right at the think, at the peak of uh, of the of the crazy times, yeah. uh, and and before that. Um, and so, our last round was um, uh, raised in January of twenty one. And uh, sorry, of 22, what, what year are we in? Yes, of 22, we raised a billion dollars uh, uh, at that point in time. A, a, a billion, and uh, what, uh, what valuation do, do you know? Um, at the time it was at uh, 40 billion. 40 billion, okay. I guess we, we don't know what the valuation is now, so we haven't done uh, 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 another round, but um, uh, uh, very, very cool. Good stuff, well look, we, we wanna talk about a little bit about you know how to build a market leading product but before we get into that given your career paypal facebook now check out you know can you share just a couple of lessons that you, you know that you personally had so far in your career in product that you you know could be uh, I, I guess you, you know sort of interesting to our audience i think that look there, there are a lot of lessons and and, and some of them might might sound uh, a bit cliche when you when when you're when you're not when, when you're not doing it. But, but one thing that I've really tried to, that, that, that I've picked up in a, in a couple of different instances is really trying to understand what the customer problem is and what problem we're trying to solve. And once you do that, but in a, in, not in a superficial way, but in a deep way, you're able to really create pro products that have very good traction, product market fit, uh, et cetera, et cetera. You know, there's, for example, you know, we were working on a product at, at PayPal, which was an idea. We didn't really under like, like it was someone's idea. We thought, hey, this is pretty cool. Uh, we want to build it. I won't get into like all of the, uh, all of the specific details, but you know, we were doing a lot of customer, we were doing a lot of customer research and you're trying to understand like, hey, what would you use this for? What would you use this for? And we got to the understanding that, you know, this is something that would really help groups collect uh, money when they're going on a school trip or when they're going on a bachelor party or when there is a, a, a gift that you need to, uh, to buy for the uh, kids' uh, kindergarten uh, birthday party. And once we unlocked sort of the, the, what people were thinking about as they were uh, building out the, uh, as, as, as they were, we were describing the product to them, we, we built features uh, that, that helped support that particular use case uh, and expanded it. And that helped us gain uh, a lot of traction. It also helped drive a lot of the virality uh, that the product had, because essentially, since it was inherently a group uh, product, you know, you could send invites uh, to a lot of different people. You could create a lot of different uh, viral uh, cycles uh, within it. So 
really trying to understand what problem does this actually solve for the customer, even if you, you have an idea. This wasn't our initial idea. This wasn't our initial notion. So taking that and building uh, on top of that. The other one I would say is like not to be afraid of ditching your ideas. And, and I've seen like too many product teams that have this original thing in their head and, and I've fallen down with this uh, as well. You, you know, you have this concept that like, this is what the user should be doing, but they're actually using the product, either not using the product or not using the pro or, or not using the product in the, in the way that it was intended or for some other reason, whether it's from an external perspective, from a, from, a, from a privacy perspective, from a regulatory perspective, the idea just doesn't work. It, not being afraid to say, we messed up, this is not working, let's ditch it and let's try uh, some, something else. That's perhaps something that I, I learned, especially on the, uh, with our experiment on, at Facebook of like, what is the right moment in time to, 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 to stop and, and, and try to do something else. Yeah, I, I mean, I can only imagine, uh, well, perhaps both in product, but founders as well, having a product that they're really going to believe in, that is actually not, you know, it's not working, but they're just kind of carrying on because they they, they have this belief and it's just going to hamper the uh, uh, the business and team and, uh, and morale. Absolutely. Right? Um, um, and, Absolutely. And then what about, obviously, like, say, like, check out, you know, 1,900 people, last valuation 40 billion you know a product that's used by 1500 enterprises sort of globally so then going into some of the lessons from building a market leading product uh, with checkout uh, i mean i guess you could also if you want to you know refer to facebook and paypal as well some great you know companies and market leading you know products within those companies so the first question how do you think about building product i guess it could be a bit of a broad question but yeah, it's kind of like kicking off with that. You know, how do you think about sort of like building a product? Uh, it's a, it is a very broad question. I think, you know, the, as, as I said, as I mentioned before, like starting with like customer problem and what, what can you imagine this doing for, uh, for, for a customer? I think creating a, an experience that customers will, will find uh, delightful in whatever uh, way, way, shape, or form. I don't think that it's important. It's, it's absolutely critical um, to figure out the full monetization strategy or how does this become a business uh, from the fir very first day. But I do think that it's important to have a line of sight to it, uh, meaning Somewhere early in the discovery, having a notion of how does this become a business, I don't think that you have to like fully figure it out and fully sort of flesh out all of the details. But if you don't have a good notion of how does this become a business, then I think that you're, it kind of, it, it, it will never come, uh, if you will. So spending some time of it earlier on uh, about, uh, about the business aspects. And then I think that it's, it's about, you know, especially as you scale, I'm not talking about like a startup with like a, when, when, the, when it's a founder and, and maybe like a few engineers, you know, when it's a scaled thing where you're building multiple products, et cetera, et cetera. I think it's about like setting up the right teams, giving them um, a clear idea of, of the mission and what uh, OKR, what, what, what uh, metric they're, they're trying to move and trying to give them as much autonomy as possible and as much empowerment as possible to, to run. Because at the end of the day, they're going to be close, as close as, as, as they need to be to the customer. They're going to, need to, they're going to be as close as necessary to the details and are going to be able to, to, to run on their, on their own. And then like my job is as, 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 a, as a chief product officer is to, you know, help them think about their ideas is to help them um, to, is to challenge them on their sort of hypotheses and their, the, the way that they're thinking through the steps and also help them unblock as, as things come up and, and as organizations get bigger, there are multiple functions and, you know, you need to, to unblock with, or they may need more resources or may, they may not have thought of a resource that they can leverage in order to, to solve a particular problem that they're trying to solve. 
Uh, thanks for sharing that. And what about like your, your thoughts? I'm assuming you have sp some specific thoughts about you know how you structure product teams. Now, obviously, checkout is you know as you say like 1,900 people. Most of the listeners on this podcast will will have much smaller companies. So in in terms of how you think about that, which would be I guess translatable to the audience. Uh, what are your specific thoughts in, in structuring product teams? So, f first of all, you know, I, I would say starting lean and, and, and to a large degree, you know, startups that are just starting, that, that's a, almost a, that's almost mandatory or almost a prerequisite, right? Like you, you, you don't have endless resources where you can, you know, put a, 50 person team on a particular project or something like that. But I think that generally, even for scale ups, even for companies that do have uh, broader resources or larger teams, starting a project around with an idea and a smaller team that, uh, that focuses on it usually yields uh, a lot of value in the early iteration process. Um, and from there you can, you can scale. And similarly to what has, as I talked about the product uh, uh, before, I think giving the team a clear area of responsibility, trying to make sure that they, you know, that, that their sort of boundaries are, are, are more or less clear. Uh, sometimes you want to give people sort of free, unbounded uh, exploration, but a lot, most of the times you want to give them some sort of sort of guardrails around, like this is the area more or less that you should be focusing on. You don't want to create... I don't personally, I know that some companies believe it. Uh, I don't personally believe in like giving two teams the same remit and having them like compete with each other. I don't think that's a good, healthy strategy for, for a company. I think it creates a toxic culture, et cetera. So making sure that the company doesn't, that the team doesn't have sort of step on other people's toes from that perspective, giving them a sort of a clear domain with maybe some idea of like the domain expertise that they would need to develop in order to do that. And then, as I said, like as much autonomy as possible and an ability to sort of check in with leadership on uh, how we're doing, uh, where you can get unblocked, uh, et cetera. So I know this is a little bit general, but it's, but it's essentially what I tried to do when I joined uh, Checkout as I was assessing the company uh, and, and the product team is trying to understand where do we, where is there overlap between the team? Uh, where are teams sort of running into each other uh, where do we need sort of vertical domain expertise? Where do we have like infrastructure teams? And so trying to build essentially the product stack by building your 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 product teams. And then the last thing that that is very very important to me personally, uh, and I think I've seen great product development teams work very well together, is this notion of uh, of an in a box, right? which is which essentially means that you know product and engineering are tied at the hip so i work very very closely with my partner cto and we've we've tried to we've replicated the the org structure essentially as a mirror of each other on the product side and the engineering side but then also having sort of the designer around the table uh, and the data scientists around the table and the um when necessary a pmo around the table and when necessary a pmm uh, around the table and then all of that group functions as a joint sort of leadership group for the uh, for the product team and are driving together um, the roadmap. And you know, I, I like to see say that like when when teams function very very well, it's sometimes not clear who's doing what exactly. There there's some degree of overlap. Um, of course, every like function will spike uh, towards a certain it's domain expertise, right? Like the marketing team will, will spike towards the marketing, but it doesn't mean that the engineer can't challenge the marketeer around, you know, is this like really the value prop and is this how we should be communicating it first? And also the product manager to challenge the designer around how the experience is, is forming and so on and so forth. So really trying to create a, uh, an atom that, that functions uh, together and, and drives the team uh, forward. Why do you think Checkout is a market-leading product, you know, has these 1,500 enterprise customers? I mean, obviously, if it repeats some of the stuff you've already said, that, 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 that's fine. But like, what makes Checkout a market-leading product? And in your view, what makes a market-leading product? Yeah, I, th I think that it's, we, we're intensely customer-focused. 
I think that that comes through in, in the product that we build. It also comes through in our in, in the service uh, that we give. And, you know, that's a lot of credit to our, our commercial team, our customer care team that really try to uh, partner uh, and consult uh, the end customer to uh, get to better results. Like we, like one of our fundamental beliefs is that, you know, our business is one where we, when we are successful, uh, our customer is successful and vice versa, interests are completely aligned. And so we are, and, and this is not just like a, uh, a thing that we're, we say, like we, we try to make the, our customer more successful and therefore uh, uh, we'll make more money, we'll make, generate more revenue, et cetera, et cetera. Two, I think is that, and this is particularly important in, I think in payments and financial services specifically, the, this, the, one of the most important decisions that I think Guillaume took early on is, is to go very, very deep. And so to, to leverage as little as possible third-party providers that provide a certain capability uh, in the stack and really do be vertically uh, integrated uh, for, uh, for payments. That gives us the ability to, A, uh, control the experience. That gives us the ability to give, um, to modify and tweak the messages that we send uh, through the, the schemes in order to optimize uh, uh, the acceptance rate for our customer, which is one of the most important metrics that they measure us on, like how many of the transactions are actually going through. Um, so by going very, very deep, we're able to manipulate uh, the messages that go through in a very uh, meaningful way. Uh, we're also able to, to do um, retries and, 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 and create a, a sophisticated logic uh, around that. And that helps us be differentiated uh, in the market. So I think that figuring out where the, what the moat could be built around and where to go deep versus where to go fast uh, I think is is a very very critical decision in every um, well not I don't know if in every but in many uh, startups uh, timeline. I guess this year and, and and still right now, you know, generative AI is like you you know you you hear about it uh, everywhere, right? It, it's on the on the the top of everybody's tongue and, and more. What what are your thoughts on it? Like, how is checkout you know thinking about it? I'd be keen to know. Yeah, I, I was waiting for the AI question. Like, you can't have any conversation in tech today without without talking about AI, right? I mean, look, I I have to say it's like it's pretty fascinating how how much these capabilities have. I I don't know if they've only evolved just now, right? Like, this is years and years and years of development, but I think the 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 the, the explosion that it's had over the last three to six months into the market and all the use cases is, is just is just fascinating and phenomenal. I, I think that generally speaking, time will tell what, uh, where generative AI and LLMs will, will, will play uh, over time. I think that there are definitely areas that I, can or, that I and we can already see that it will definitely play a big role, right? Like, one is uh, around customer support. I think that, and, and this is like general, it's not just for payments, et cetera. I think that, you know, whereas uh, historically these like chatbots used to be like pretty lame and, you know, could, could answer with scripts. I, I think that the fact that there is a understanding and, and an understanding of the language uh, of what the other side is, uh, or the customer is saying, and, and being able to generate from a knowledge base an answer that is rational, that is clo that, and there's recall that is close to what a human could be doing, I think that that will revolutionize uh, customer support. And, and I think that we see use cases for it uh, in that space, um, and I think that many others are as well. I think that the product, like, like development engineers, will have a, I don't know that it will replace coding, um, but I think that it, there will definitely be a very helpful assistant that uh, engineers will have when they're developing and maybe like uh, automate away uh, a lot of the uh, you know, menial tasks that, uh, that engineers sometimes have to do. Or, or maybe they could, like an engineer could just tell the AI, like, hey, create a testing plan and test this. 
and, and the AI will, will, will know how to do it. I think we're starting to see uh, these types of capabilities. I definitely see like how it's going to help, like create like workflow efficiencies for, for, for everyone, uh, right? Like whether it's recalling information is, is, is going to be done differently. Like if you think about today, how you, you, you try to recall like what, the, what you decided uh, in a certain, or what someone decided in a certain meeting, you, you know, you're trying to, you're searching for an email or, 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 or a wiki or something, and you have like keywords, you're like, you're trying to remember the date or who said what, and like, what was a keyword in the decision rather than asking the natural question, which is, what did we decide about this and this and that? So if you train, you feed the model with all of the data, the internal data uh, of the company, or, or all of like your emails, um, um, et cetera, I think that the AI will be able to generate those answers and you'll be able to be much more efficient from that perspective. You know, you'll be able to write emails um, or write do uh, memos in a more efficient way. Um, so these are some of like the, the obvious use cases that I think are maybe applicable to everyone. I think that for, for payments and financial services, you know, there's definitely very interesting use cases with risk management and fraud management to identify patterns. And, uh, and definitely as far as, you know, providing advice uh, to people, like providing sort of financial advice to people based on a, a world knowledge base. I think that there's definitely stuff that can be done uh, there as well. These are just some top of mind thoughts. <laughs> That Very cool. No, I appreciate you sharing those. So we'll, let's move into the quick, uh, quick-ish fire round uh, now. So, okay. what one thing has moved the needle the most for you in your career? I would say that um, seeing an opportunity, having it feel more or less right, and jumping on it. And let me just—I know this is a quick round, but I'll just say, like, I didn't have a sort of—I uh, don't—I didn't have a career roadmap. I know some people really like to do that. And I talked to, to, to folks earlier on in their careers, like in three years, I want to do this. In five years, I want to do that. In order to do that, I need to do 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 do, do. It's good to like to know like what your next step is or like maybe two steps ahead. But for me personally, it's been, you know, uh, focus on your work, do something awesome. Something comes up, jumping on it, moving to the next thing, moving to the next thing. And it's worked well. I think that, you know, uh, I, I a lot of times to, to, to folks uh, on my team, the advice that I give is, is, you know, do great work and good things will come, good things will come your way. What's the best advice you've ever received? I've received a lot of good advice, but from a, from a leadership perspective, I would say being open and transparent with people. What is the biggest mistake product teams make and how would you avoid it? I think I mentioned this before, but I think that like falling in love with the idea that they had and not being like really to be willing to be like intellectually honest and, uh, and, and, and pivoting and changing uh, and taking way, way too long. So staying with the idea, like th 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 there's such a, it's really sort of such a hard balance between sort of persistence because like there are some things that you really need to persist on and to continue, but then, you know, you, you have to have a sense of like, Hey, we've tried everything and it's not working. Like, should I run the hundreds experiment to try to improve this thing and optimize it by another sort of few basis points? Or should I just quit and, and try something uh, completely different? And, and finding that balance and missing it is like one of the biggest mistakes that uh, I think I've seen uh, uh, product teams do. What's your favorite book on products? Okay, um, I'll, I'll be honest with you. I don't like really read proper uh, product and business books. I, I find that I learn uh, much more through experience. I will say it's not a prop, it's not a official uh, product book, but I've, I've recently read uh, the Hail Mary project by Andy Weir, the guy who wrote the, the Martian that was made into a movie. And, and they, and they talk about, they build a spaceship and it goes to like another star system. And just the way that they thought about the product and that the, the gardening of the resources, essentially all humankind um, sort of uh, unites behind this thing was, was, was a fascinating sort of way to think about big projects and moving quickly uh, with the big projects. So it's more of a inspirational and also pretty interesting, but not like a proper product book. Outside of checkout, what is your favorite SaaS product and why? I'm glad you, you, you gave me the out on, on checkout because I would have had to say that, obviously. Yeah. I think I, I find uh, Figma uh, to be a 
fascinating product. Um, I think obviously it's it's been it's given designers like very 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 strong tools. But more recently, we've started using their collaboration uh, uh, tool, the FigJam, which I've found to be a like really neat to use and the user interface and and also you know while we're still a lot of us are remote or if we have international teams like really bring the collaboration of the team together and give uh, diverse opinions equal voice uh, ar ar around the table so i found that to be very very fascinating i i have uh, another one which which might be uh, a bit unpopular but and, and maybe folks haven't uh, given it a chance, but my former employer, Facebook, like has an in, like an internal Facebook for for teams. Uh, it's, it's called Workplace, and I found this tool to be extremely, extremely useful for collaboration. And you know, when you think about everything as like a post on a on a social media website, you it really changes the way that you share information across the organization in, in terms of how people collaborate how they uh with how they uh, consume uh, information uh, and so i found it to be uh, extremely uh, good and useful as well so i gave you two sorry awesome oh, oh no thanks for sharing that well look we've come to the end of the podcast really appreciate you coming on the SaaS revolution show today and sharing with the, the SaaS dot community where can people find you online if they want to reach out ask any questions linkedin i think is a really good one and then uh and then we can move to whatsapp if if if, if we want to but that's uh that's the usual place to find me all right. Sounds good. Well, Meron Kobachi, CPO of uh, Checkout, thank you so much for being on the SaaS Revolution Show. Thank you very much, Alex. It's a pleasure.